All right, hello everyone, and welcome back to another video. Today I got a, another special guest with us. It's a, I know this is going to be a highly requested interview. I got Vivek Sinhar with us here today, um, and he's going to be talking about his experiences as a mining engineer. So he's originally from India, did a master's at UBC here, UBC here in Canada, and he's going to share with us some of his work experience, his education experience, and his experience moving and working here in Canada. So Vivek, uh, maybe do you want to fill in the blanks and talk a little bit more about just the introduction about yourself? Sure, sure. Hello, Kwan. Uh, and a big hello to all the audiences. So, um, so the basic background, if I talk about in snapshot, it would be I finished my bachelor's in mining engineering from back in India, uh, graduated in 2011, and then worked uh, under, in an, a greenfield project, underground uh, hard metal. Uh, so hard rock and soft rock are different. So worked hard rock for a year or so, and then underground uh, coal, so that is soft rock for a year or so, and then uh, plan to go in uh, and do a master's so that I can uh, specialize in something in mining. And as you would have seen from videos from Quan, um, there's a lot to actually uh, take in and there are many specialty roles which you want to grow into. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to get into my master's. Once I finished my master's, which also included working in oil sands uh, as long-term tailings planning engineer for a bit, um, I got the opportunity to work as a blast specialist, uh, which was probably coming out of not just being a mining engineer, but also getting into other roles. Uh, that brought me back to India uh, and also got me a chance to move around different countries and take different kinds of blasts and stuff. Um, and at some point of time, when I realized I have a family and uh, you need to have a work-life balance and you've moved around a lot, um, I thought probably Canada would be the best place to come back. Um, fortunately, my company for which I was working at that point of time, which is Orica, uh, world's largest explosive manufacturer. Um, they gave me an opportunity to work with WebGen, and that's like the first step towards automation of blasting. So it's it started with some trials, uh, and we are in the phase of expansion now. So that's where I stand. I currently live in Sudbury, and probably just bought a house in Sudbury a month back. Oh, congratulations. So settling down. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So that's a uh, long story short. That's that's the synopsis of what I've done for the last 10 years. Well, we're very excited to have you today. I think this is going to be a great interview. We've got lots to go through. Um, so we'll, we'll get started from the beginning. Um, your experience in IIT. So you, you did a bachelor's in mining engineering or mining and mineral processing engineering. Uh, so for me, I'm not as uh, familiar with the Indian education system. But I, as far as I know, like uh, IIT is like one of the best technical universities in India. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experiences there? So, for example, like, uh, did you specialize in mining engineering right away, or is it like in Canada where first year is um, you do generic engineering courses, and then in second year you specialize? So sure. So um, yes, as as you suggested, it's it's pretty difficult getting into the IITs in India. Uh, it was a really long uh, journey to prepare for it and get into it. Uh, about mining engineering, I'd say that uh, I'm literally the third generation in mining from my family. So it was an obvious choice. Um, at the same time, I all around my childhood, I lived um, in mining towns. So I was pretty used to actually living in a mining town. I'm not a Sydney or a Vancouver or a Toronto guy. So that's one of the things. Um, the other thing when I got into mining engineering, the first year is usually very generalistic. Uh, you have general studies and stuff. Um, interestingly, the studies uh, and the syllabus and everything in IITs are pretty much based on uh, most of the technical colleges in North America and Europe. So uh, it takes in a lot of the basic structures which you see uh, in North America or even in Europe or Australia. So the first year was general studies. Then you start uh, getting into the internships in the summers. Uh, one thing which is different from North America, I would say that we have an opportunity or a chance that you can go for a longer internship uh, period uh, in North America. 
Not the same case back in India. You have a fixed three to four months period every uh, summers, which you can get into uh, some kind of a training or internship, which for me was mostly operations. Um, and second year onwards, you start uh, specializing or trying to take more and more mining courses. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's how it ended. Um, a lot of my friends from my bachelor's ended up getting into finance and MBA, which is a common thing with engineers. But my uh, focus, I think, even then was to get into mining. I was not sure at that point of time as to what I would like to specialize in. Would also depend upon what kind of work-life balance you're expecting, mm-hmm. um, what kind of uh, what kind of country you want to settle in, and what kind of uh, um, mining uh, job you would be interested in terms of like um, the the kind of mines like a, a hard metal mines or a coal mines you want to work in open pit or an underground mines so that um was followed up with getting into my first job which uh, you would have seen through previous videos a lot of our audiences would have seen is is very much dependent upon the set structure back in india where uh, companies have a tie up with the college they come down and they do the interviews and tests and whatnot and they select the candidates which they are interested in so yeah, that's the snapshot for the bachelors. Okay, so um, after or yeah, your post graduation job, what would say helped you the most? Was it like the co op experience or the internship experience that you had, or was it um, heavily dependent on the grades that you got when you were studying, or maybe a little bit of both? Um, to be honest, uh, I I actually uh, put in the pointers from your videos where. A lot of your hard skills and soft skills are important as a mining engineer. So we are engineers, we work mm-hmm. with softwares, we work with machines, but we also deal with a lot of people. So your first job or second job would probably be more uh, affected by your grades and what kind of projects you have taken. Uh, but due course in time, I, I realized that it's more about connections as well as uh, what kind of people and projects and uh, what kind of interactions you had while you were working. So uh, in my earlier phase of career, I would say that uh, it was more around the projects or the grades which I had. But in due course of time, uh, it has more to do with uh, what kind of relations I have and what kind of technology you are working in Mm -hmm. and what kind of demand that has in, in in the market. Okay, yeah, so it seems very similar to my experience in Canada where if you're in maybe your first and second year because, you know, everyone doesn't really have much mining experience, it's more about the grades, but then afterwards, once you got that first internship under your belt, then it's all about the experiences that you have and, and like, where have you worked before, the people that you know. Okay. Um, and so what, what was your first job like? Um, I guess going from a student to, you know, uh, engineer, what was that experience like? Did you did you find it hard to adapt to that new job? Because like I know from transitioning from a student is you're working a lot of theoreticals, but then going to the workplace it's like it's like a whole completely different thing, right? I'm wondering if it's I the same experience with you. Yes, I completely agree with you, Quan. And a lot of uh, students who actually uh, get into mining engineering sometimes it's. It's because of the salary and sometimes the the adventure which it entails with going to different places but we often forget that mining is a lot more in hand like off hand job where you would be having a lot of experiences um especially moving from a student life to a professional life a lot of uh deadlines which you stick to you have to stick to things change it's a 24-hour operations most of the mines my first job, uh, interestingly enough, I learned a lot was a greenfield project. So it was like a completely new land lease taken. And I started interestingly with uh, the survey on the surface and like dabbling into uh, different kinds of uh, projects out there, setting up the, the inventory and setting up the logistics at some point of time, being the under manager ultimately when I quit the job at that uh, underground hard rock mines. Um, it was a different experience because um, even when you join a job, you're expecting probably a nine to five or 12 hour shifts. But when you're working in a greenfield project, time uh, or schedules or shifts kind of actually do not matter. What matters is that the job has to be done. Uh, and that actually helped me realize as to what uh, is, is, like, is a strong point for me and what are the places where I need to work. Uh, 
So the first job, all in all, helped me not just uh, technically increase my knowledge about the softwares, uh, but also helped me realize how you manage the team mm-hmm. to get the job done. So it was interesting. Yes, that's for sure. Now, that first job you had, did you say you were a uh, manager? I Yes. So I started as a graduate trainee. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. But I since it was a Greenfield project and uh, you being among those few who went through the whole process of the life where it started from uh, the first portal uh, to the first production or so it was easier for me to grow through the process organically. I, I ended up, yes, so I ended up being the under manager. Um, and luckily, I, I always say this to all the mining students who talk to me, is that your experience of an experience at the ground level, like working with the development crew or working with the production crew, helps you a lot to understand what you're designing for. Mm-hmm. So even when you work as a mine designer or a drill and blast engineer, it's is easier to forget the limitations of the machines or the underground space, for example. So it's it, it was a good experience in that sense. Um, coming back to another topic, which I truly believe is very close to me, is that um, due course of time, we often have to realize that at some point in your career, you would be growing towards an office job. Before that, as a mining engineer, I would highly suggest everyone to take those fly and fly out jobs or go to that small town, probably go for hiking in your off time, but do experience that um, uh, uh, on-field working with operations. So yeah, I I, I feel that that really helped me um, growing into my career. I see. And for, I guess, your life outside of work, you, you mentioned that you grew up in mining towns. Um, but when, when you were a student, were you in a big city? And then for this first job, this Greenfield job, I'm assuming it has to be a mining town. Was it hard to adapt to your new life uh, location? Luckily enough, Quan, um, I, when, during my childhood, I honestly lived in mining towns, but throughout my career, I have never lived in a mining town. Uh, apparently my first job was literally uh, 10 kilometers away from uh, a, a decent sized city. My second job, when I switched my uh, job to underground uh, soft rock, I came and started living in another city, which was, uh, again, like 10, 15 kilometers from a a decently sized city. Um, Even uh, when I did my internship in uh, Shell long-term tailings planning, I got a chance to live in Calgary rather than Fort McMurray. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, even after that, when I joined Orica, I was based from Delhi. So involved a lot of uh, traveling to different sites, but was based from Delhi. And even now I moved to Sudbury, which is apparently known as the mining town in Canada. You have a lot of uh, towns around, plus it's just three hours from Toronto. So uh, all in all, I won't say that I have lived that mining town, small mining town life, but I have seen my friends around the world who have uh, experienced that. And it's always a compromise. Uh, you have to realize what you're looking for. If you're an outdoorsy guy, skiing, hiking, trails, uh, it's a definite go-go. Uh, but at the same time, um, it, if you want to have a balance, I'd suggest a fly in, fly out, or a seven day in, seven day out, or 14 days in, 14 days out, uh, kind of works. Uh, sometimes 14 days in operations it's too long, but mm-hmm. then you have to see at the pros of it. The best part is that you have 14 days to yourself living yeah. in any t- any city in the world. So yeah, yeah. and especially like before COVID, like traveling would be oh, yeah. so fun, so much fun. But yeah. I guess, yeah, for now, COVID may make things a little bit, you know, the situation is a little bit different, but yeah, in general, well, yeah, that's like one of the uh, best thing about working on shift. Honestly, I, I have friends who before COVID used to work up north uh, and they used to choose 14 days in, 14 days out. But um, as one of your friends, uh, you have mentioned in one of the videos, they traveled to Italy. They had their houses in Europe, and so they used to travel from Europe. So, like, I think uh, at that point of time, sky is the limit, whatever mm-hmm. you want to do. Okay, so let's talk about your journey about uh, moving and studying at UBC. So I guess there, there must have been a point in your career um, you said you, you thought about like I want to advance my career and getting a master's degree was the best choice or best way to do that. 
Uh, can you talk a little bit more about your decision to get a master's degree? Sure. So, uh, as a lot of uh, a lot of my colleagues or friends, there for them it was to uh, advance their career in terms of degree. As to sometimes you need that specialization. For me, it was more to know as to like what should be my specialization in the sense where do I want to specialize in the mining operations and what kind of job I want to take. So. Uh, with that in mind, I applied in UBC and I applied in McGill. Uh, in hindsight, I think about it, Eastern Canada has a lot more opportunities for underground mining mm -hmm. uh, as compared to the Western Canada. And I more or less started to actually specialize in operations in underground, hard or uh, soft rock. So uh, at that point of time, I would say it was more determined by the fact that I want to explore more and more roles. So my master's was more towards mineral economics because that was something which attracted me being the under manager at some point of time in you know, one of the mines. You want to know the economics of all the operations mm -hmm. so that you can set up the priorities uh, on a day to day or a quarterly basis. Uh, but later on, it was a stroke of luck that I ended up being a blast specialist, which helped me move all around in different uh, types of jobs. So that's how it started uh, with applying in UBC. But having said that, it was a fairly uh, smooth process uh, with uh, the application, a standard uh, interview with the program manager. And going on from there, you obviously have to collect your transcripts. You have to uh, see whether your educational background actually goes hand in hand with the country where you're moving into. So all that process was done. And I would say that it was a fairly smooth process of me moving uh, into my master's after my second job. Right on. Okay, so you mentioned um, you considered Canada and UBC and McGill, but so a lot of my viewers ask um, Canada versus Australia, which is better. Uh, have you ever considered working or moving to Australia? Definitely. Uh, it is always an option for mining engineers. I think Canada and Australia are the heavens, are the two heavens for mining engineers. Uh, the and and one of the points which I thought coming from India was that Australia is a lot closer to my home country, but at the same time we have to realize as to what opportunities you're looking at. Um, for me, um, trying to think of different job opportunities in underground mining. Uh, interesting fact was if you're working in a hot country and if you're working underground, it's a lot more hot, as compared to if you're working in a cold country and underground where the temperatures are still controlled. Mm -hmm. That was one of the reasons. Uh, another reason which brought me to Canada was that my family had eventually moved to North America, so it was easier for me to be closer to my family. Another important factor, um, last but not the least, I would say, is that Aus it, trying to do your studies in Australia is, is a little more expensive as compared to Canada. So you might have to think about what kind of finances uh, you're carrying. So anyone who is coming, say, for example, from China, India, Africa, and all, and even some, a few of my friends that came from the Middle East would be to consider uh, your family, what you want to do after you finish your studies, and what kind of finances you're looking at, and what can you handle in terms of that. Yeah, that's a very good insight with the finance. And uh, I like the part, especially what you mentioned about like the temperature uh, for underground mining. It's, yeah, like, I guess it helped me a lot. <laughs> That's yeah, I haven't done underground mining, but I can imagine like just working in that super hot condition all the time. It's going to be very strenuous. Um, yes. And then I want to ask a little bit more about specifically uh, UBC versus McGill. Was there something that swayed you to UBC in particular? Um, when you're applying for a, from a different country, it's dif it's difficult to realize as to where the job markets are saturated or where you would find an opportunity. What you come up at that point of time is what university is basically recommended or what kind of rankings you get, not just at the university level, but also at a department level. Uh, seeing all that, um, I, I I had the offers from both the universities. I, I felt that it made more sense for me to go to a more uh, recognized, I would say, uh, in terms of what all universities people back in India know about, uh, rather than going for a university which I have 
I do not have a good knowledge of the background. So that catapulted me towards UBC. The second thing, which was a big influence, is that UBC has this outreach program where the professors move around the world and go to uh, universities um, around in the in the countries where most of these uh, uh, applicants come from. So I had had the chance to actually uh, sit in one of those uh, conferences or meetings where professors from UBC had shown up. So it was also an inclination factor as to what kind of courses you can take, what kind of majors you can do. So that that all these uh, pointers actually pushed me towards UBC rather than McGill. I see. Okay. Uh, and in terms of finances, a lot of my viewers ask me, are there scholarships for people going to UBC, especially for international students? Uh, can you talk more about the financing aspect of a master's degree, uh, spe specifically at UBC? Right. Yeah. So uh, I would actually point out my brother also came to US to do uh, his master's in petroleum, and he got a full scholarship. So there is a difference between uh, you do uh, a master's of engineering or you do a master's of science. So with master's of science, you're highly dependent upon uh, the lab which you're working for or the professors because they help you get your um, uh, scholarships and also sometimes help you with uh, your day-to-day -day expenses. With masters of engineering, that's not a part and it is mostly uh, directed towards people who have some kind of experience. So you definitely need to uh, plan for the whole mining, uh, like the master's period tuition, tuition fees. But at the same time, I never applied for a scholarship. I never got one. I never actually tried to get a research assistant position uh, at the university. One of the reasons being uh, that I felt it's more important for me to reach the market and be more hands-on. Uh, I was more dependent upon my savings and also the loan, which I took uh, a study loan. Uh, and I knew at uh, even at that point of time that um, as soon as you have finished your studies, there will be a time when you can pay it back. So mm -hmm. that never occurred to me that finances could be an issue. But having said that, it is one of the major issues for people coming from Africans uh, and India. And I would I'd completely say flat on that you should not be worried about what's going to happen and how would it be paid back. You should more uh, cling on to the fact that you are getting into a, a good course. You're trying to learn as much as possible and you're trying to build on on the network when you go to those countries. Because coming to a new country, trying to penetrate a new market, you have to focus more on what's next rather than how would you come back and pay the tuition fees? Because in hindsight, it took me, what, six months to finish off my tuition debt, which uh, someone coming down would be thinking would be like uh, probably clinging to them for a year or two. So tuition fees, especially um, in Canada or Australia, should not affect. Um, it's funny because I just in the previous question said that Australia, you have to pay more as compared to Canada in terms of studies. But down the line, I realized that that should not be the choice factor for your course when you're coming to a country. Yeah, I guess like relatively to, for example, degrees in the US, both Canada and Australia are relatively cheap. And uh, paying your loans uh, after six months after graduation, that's, that's actually pretty fast. Uh, yeah. So congrats on that. Uh, oh, thank you. And so uh, as for the I forgot what I was going to ask. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about the postgraduate work placement program um, and the visa associated with your degree. Um, so you went through, I think you're, you finished your de uh, degree in two years, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, let's go ahead with the question. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, once you finish your studies, do you automatically get the two years of like the postgraduate work placement? Uh, are you talking about after the master's? Yeah. Okay. So uh, my my master's was a little more extended than the usual master's of engineering. That had more to do with me trying to uh, figure out again what I want to specialize in. I'd also had to do with my internship, uh, how long your internships go on. Uh, all these factors are also affected by the visa. So I was kind of lucky, lucky again with my visa. Usually you get 
the study permit for the duration of the course and people have to separately apply for uh, internship visa um, but for me uh, at the port of entry i got both of them in my hand uh, even when i didn't know as to what does this internship visa mean uh, but having said that if you're a student you're coming in you will typically get the study visa for the period and then you have to apply for an internship visa once you have an internship in your hand. Uh, during my two years courses, I would say that it was more or less affected by the length of my internship. But uh, after the master's was over, it was all to myself to apply for positions. Um, interestingly enough, you would see uh, it was a, at that point of time, Canadian market was going through a downturn from um, the Lehman Brothers fallout in 2009. Um, so instead of just applying throughout Canada, I started applying internationally because we have to realize that after a master's degree from UBC, it's, it is an international degree. We are not just regulated by, uh, like as a fresher, you don't, you're not regulated by any sort of exam. Uh, and that uh, made me land into the job as in Orica. Um, but for a lot of people, it would be around um, applying to different jobs within the country or the region itself. And there it comes if you're applying in Canada, and I can definitely say this, uh, moving to offices, meeting the managers uh, of the companies where you want to work with does help. A lot of my friends at that point of time um, are face to face before COVID. Um, interactions and uh, dropping in your resume does help. So there was no no sort of any structured uh, way to um, to get a job but at the same time there are, there are many people who have done that and it is a vicious cycle you're coming out of uh, uh, studies you don't have any regional experience but more people interaction does help in in, in securing that first job mm -hmm. totally agree and would you happen to know let's just say graduate from ubc uh, and then how long of a period do you have to get a job before your student visa expires or does it expire right away when you graduate so the student visa is say for example uh, if you have a two-year course or 24 months you would get it for 24 months or so but it is automatically um, a part of the immigration process that you have if you have studied for two years you automatically get a three-year work visa. So as soon as you finish your studies uh, for two years from a recognized university, and that is very important for all the audiences, that it has to be a recognized uh, university with a recognized degree, which they have in the immigration list, uh, you can apply and get your three years work visa. And that three-year work visa, uh, whether you work for uh, a full-time mining company, uh, that's what's called a B-level job in Canada, or you work uh, at a part-time uh, store, it does not matter. That gives you the window where you can apply to different positions and try to figure out what you want to do uh, next in terms of your career. Um, but the whole process was pretty smooth for me. I had to extend my study visa um, because I extended my master's a bit. But as soon as I finished my graduation, I applied for my work visa, had it for three years, and, uh, and then it goes on as to whether you want to get into a Canadian job or you want to go out. So you have everything settled down. One thing I would add to this is that once you get a job, it's much easier to switch from the work visa towards permanent residence if you're thinking of settling down in, in that particular country uh, for a longer period of time. Okay, I see. So, and you also did a co-op during your master's, is that correct? Yes. So yeah. Masters of Engineering is a little different from Masters of Science. Uh, as the na name suggests, uh, Masters of uh, MEng, what we call, is more industrial based. So it, it is uh, more inclined towards you trying to get an internship uh, where the university does help. Uh, and there's a few of the job fairs which happen at the university. But at the same time, um, these internships help you to make uh, good friends. Uh, have a uh, decent networking with people in the industry and also to know as to whether uh, the the job and work-life balance, I should say, does it suit you or not. So uh, I've, I have a few friends uh, who would definitely attest to this fact that 
working in different regions around the world in mining has different work-life balances. So you have to first know that as well. So it does help. During my internship, I would say that um, I flew with uh, whatever was thrown towards me, and it was pretty interesting. Um, and uh, honestly, it would be quite, uh, an coincidence that we both almost did the same kind of internship at that point of time. So um, probably not for the audiences, but you and I know as to uh, internships could be sometimes a bit busy, but mm -hmm. it was interesting to have different challenges. Yeah, let's dive a little bit more deeper about the uh, co-op program at UBC. So I've been through it, so I know a little bit about it. Um, but from a master's candidate perspective, um, can you just go, briefly go over what that process is like? Like how, how do you get into the UBC co-op program? Um, and then once you get into it, sort of the fees and how you land a co-op job afterwards. Sure. So uh, the it was probably around six, seven years back. So the process... Once you actually uh, register for the UBC co-op program, uh, it is pretty structured. They help you go through a lot, more, a lot of uh, soft skill training. They help you work with your resume, which did help me a lot. Um, and the same time, also help you prepare for interviews and stuff. A lot of the companies who uh, come in for hiring co-op students, they they start with uh, a, co a quantitative test and then go into the soft skills with interviews and stuff. Uh, one pointer which did really help me, and I would say that it, it's going to help anyone who is getting into any interview, is that once a question is asked, uh, what any company is looking for is like, what was the problem statement, what uh, and what you did to actually solve that issue. So giving the full cycle of things does help uh, the interviewers as well. Uh, all these small things, uh, UBC co-op program did help me. Um, during the internship period, you have to be paying a minimal amount. I think it was four hundred dollars Canadian dollars uh, through every semester, which you're doing an internship. Mm -hmm. uh, the UBC co-op program, while registering, I would say uh, you go with the resume, um, uh, work with a team. You work with a team for your interview preparation, and you also uh, go through the UBC co-op uh, program manager. Uh, and trying to understand what your interests and specialities are. So that's what I remember from six or seven years back. Uh, but I, I would say that there'd be a few things which would have changed between me doing it and now how things are. Yeah, that's a possibility. It all changes. Uh, you, you mentioned something about the resume was very helpful. So I actually sometimes get people sending me the resumes, um, students from India. Um, and I noticed it's actually quite different than the Canadian resume format. Uh, can you speak a little bit to what you think the key differences are between an Indian style format resume versus in a Canadian style resume? Definitely. So uh, the Indian style resume is more structured around what you have done um, in, in qualitative sense. Uh, the formats, it's very subjective, um, uh, as all of us would have gone through, say, for example, an Ivy League resume format but even there you have different options but the basic sense or essence of every uh, profile which you have worked on would would end up in India's for example as what you did what I realized during my uh, resume coaching period was that um, say for example I have supervised a team it would be better to know as to how big the team you managed what were the challenges you faced and what you did which was uh, exceptionally well or different from others who are actually applying so if i supervised a team of 400 people uh, how i tackled a problem and how i was able to achieve something which was say for example expected or was a, a big achievement for the team so you could see if 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 you go through my resume that my most of my statements are well, it's not updated right now in the last couple of years because I've been working in the same company, but you would more focus towards what was the target, what you achieved, and what was the best part of that achievement. So it should be a full cycle, as I always say, and that is also part of the interview because a person who is going through a resume in a three-second or five-second period, it is important to know as to what uh, every line means in terms of what you achieved. 
the other important factor which i realized at some point of time was when you open a resume and most of the resumes are either in a hard format or it's open on a screen when it goes to uh, interview or hr the first thing which they look at our resume is right at the center so when you open your a4 resume something which comes right in the middle is is something which they go through a study in that 3 seconds so anything which is right at the center should be the most important achievement which you have done in the last period or so um, so these small things for example with resume did help and how you prepare for an interview so yeah that's there awesome thanks for those tips Uh, another question I want to ask about is what was your experience like living in Canada? So you, you've been in three cities: Vancouver, Calgary, and now Sudbury. Uh, for me, I found Vancouver to be quite an e uh, easy city to settle in because there's a very diverse um, ethnic populations. So I imagine, like for people uh, that are from India, it'll be easier for them to settle in because there's already quite a big Indian population in Vancouver. Uh, and then you did your co-op in Calgary. Can you speak more to about like um, how were you able to tap to the different lifestyles, the climate? Like for me, I found when I moved from Vancouver to Calgary for the first time, it was super cold. I wasn't used yeah. to it for the first few months. Can you just speak to uh, some of your experiences regarding those things? Sure. Um, so uh, just for the audiences, I've moved around a lot. I have I've had opportunities to be in different countries and like go through a project and stuff. uh with canada it's a little different because you see a lot of uh, indian Im uh, immigration population in many different cities uh sudbury is not an exception you would see a lot of uh, indian community here as well uh the difference i would say that uh vancouver was a lot easy going as compared to say for example toronto but the community is still there um just to point out a fact uh yes moving towards eastern canada is a lot more cold or center of canada but then again we often forget that vancouver has a lot of rain so you get used to being in a wet condition for most of the year so every city i would say has different challenges in terms of weather uh you have to be prepared in a different way for example even now traveling by road to northern canada you need to have different um, safety precautions which you have to take um in terms of uh being in a different culture or as a mix of culture i would say that the more the merrier um chances of meeting people from different culture has always uh, intrigued me and that has always been there with i would say uh age you do realize that you have to settle down uh at at one point um even now i my first preference was to do a fly and fly out from vancouver to where i was working right now but moving into sudbury and during the covid period although not the best time to actually explore a town or a city I started liking the place. Um and this is what I have realized with most of the people that when they come down to a region they want to stick to that because it's more comfortable but my suggestion would be try to uh, explore more and more regions uh, because you'll find something good bad and something really ugly about the towns and that would help you realize in due course of time is this the place where you want to settle down. So it it has been a mixed experience whether it's Vancouver Toronto uh, most recently Montreal as you would have known so uh, i have good and bad memories from all the places and i would say any town could be a good town to uh, to settle down it'll all depend upon what opportunities you have and what kind of community you are uh, sharing your uh, time with yeah i would agree like canada is such a big country such literally second biggest country on earth so there's lots to explore yeah. and every place has exactly. their own unique perks that they offer Um now I want to move on to talk more about your your experiences working at Orica. Um you bounced back between India and Canada for for working at Orica. Uh I'm just curious. So I know in Canada there's the PN where you need to work a certain amount of uh time period before you can register to become a professional engineer. Um yeah. so just wondering what your journey was like for that or maybe you didn't do that because there's a separate uh professional organization in India that maybe you wanted to uh enroll in so just wondering uh can you speak more to about your your journey as a engineer sure so uh it's quite interesting a lot of people have asked that question that why haven't you done your png yet uh, i have been thinking about it now uh because i might be settling down uh, now especially after this covid period 
but uh, it it had more to do with uh, so apparently uh, just before that I I want to uh, talk that every big country where you have mining you have some kind of a uh, a professional degree so PNG it is in Canada and says to some extent the same thing in Australia we have a second class and a first class mining engineering certificate back in India I never was interested in that even back in India. Uh, the reason being, I was always a globe trotter, so I wanted to roam around. I didn't know as to which country I would settle in. Um, coincidentally, it's happening now, so I would think about p getting my PNG pretty soon. Um, uh, talking about being or working in uh, Orica, I had the opportunity to move to, I think, at least five to six countries because of job and around more than 300 cities around the world. So uh, it's been an interesting experience trying to take underwater blasts to moving to defense projects, to uh, uh, caverns and cave blasting, to urban construction blasting. So all in all, I would say my experience with Orica has been pretty good. Uh, I had no SAR experiences yet. It's been uh, f uh, four and a half years now. Um, even now, I would say anyone who is moving to a different region or a country uh, for all the audiences i would suggest it has more to do with where you want to settle down because every country would have different uh, set of um, uh, professional certificates which you want to do but it has more to do with where you want to settle down so if you've decided this is going to be your spot so you should go through all the professional uh, degrees or professional certificates uh, in my case as i said um, I'm just now realizing that probably I will be settling down in Canada, but who knows? So, yeah, for COVID, uh, hopefully, to an end soon, it could change things, travel plans. Uh, yes. So, Vivek, we're uh, reaching the end of our interview. We've covered a lot of things. We went through your experiences, um, starting with uh, being in IIT and then postgraduate jobs, moving to Canada to study at UBC, living in Canada, and a job at Orica. Um, do you have any last words of advice to people who are especially from India? Uh, most of my viewers are from India and they want to do a master's in Canada or just work in Canada. Uh, do you have any last words of advice for those people? Sure, sure, Khan. So I have just two advices. One, uh, be fearless because mining engineering, uh, if you would have gone through Khan's videos, you would see that gives you an opportunity to move around and see and have different experiences. Try to have it before your age actually stops it. Um, so don't think about the consequences now. Just think about what you want to do um, as a mining engineer or just as a plane engineer. And the second uh, advice I would give is that give time to whatever specialization you're getting into. Because I have seen a lot of people jumping and dabbling between different professions. It does not help you in long term because uh, it gives the employers uh, an idea that uh, what your mind is focused on. So these would be my two advices. Has helped me a bit. I've made a few mistakes during this uh, course, but uh, all in all, I'm, I'm satisfied and I believe that anyone who has gone through the process would be having the same feeling. So that's from me. Awesome, thank you Vivek. Uh, so if the audience have more questions, um, are you open to letting them contact you? And if so, what's the best way for them to reach out? Sure. Um, uh, thanks a lot for the for the discussion, Kwan. Um, and for the audiences, uh, they can connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, my profile is uh, by the name of Vivek Sena. I do look uh, a, a handsome person in my LinkedIn, so you'd be able to recognize me, I think. Uh, apart from that, I would say uh, if you have any questions, you can throw in uh, uh, on, on my email ID. That's uh, vivek 17 sena at gmail.com. Um, and I'll surely try to help uh, whoever I can in whatever capacity I can. Awesome, Vivek. Well, on behalf of me and my audience, like, thank you so much. We, you dropped a lot of great advice. And just thank you so much for coming on and sharing your life experiences. Uh, truly appreciate it. So thank you very much, Vivek. Pleasure is mine. Thank you. Thank you, Juan.